Welcome back to a Celtic state of mind. I was just saying to Lloyd Patrick Jepson, it is becoming like the Axom Therapy Bulletin. I welcome back Jim Orr also to his normal Friday birth. Jim, I was just saying I'm really looking forward to hearing your take on all things <laughs> Celtic, on all things Ange. You have a very specific take on things. Lloyd, you're on the side of the fence where you're, you're thinking, I'm bailing out here, he's gone. I'm still pretty confident that he won't and we'll be uh, swinging back and forth because obviously that's the way this week has gone. It's a bit of a shame though, Jim, when you consider where we are and what we're looking forward to tomorrow, that everything is being dominated by the future of Ange Postecoglou. Yeah, I think we're all obsessed with Celtic. Why would you tune into something at half past 12 on a Friday if you're not obsessed with Celtic? So we pour over every bit of information, I, I never get too worked up about things that might happen, because it might not happen, so let's not get too uh, uptight about things, and I think uh, if you take Angie out of the equation, take Spurs out of the equation, because I, I don't like to talk about specifics, but if you if you thought about where are we in the football food chain within Scotland, we're at the top table, you know, we're kind of at the top of the top table, you know, we are the, we are the top dogs in Scotland, and uh, Within the bubble of Scottish football, that's a big thing. Uh, as I said before, in any metric you want, to use, forget Lisbon, forget nine in a row, forget quadruple treble. And here and now, we are the top dogs by a mile. But outside the Scottish bubble, we're pretty much nothing, I think. In terms of European football, food chain, we're not even at the table, fact, outside looking in the window, trying to get a part of that. So if you work in Scotland, you're not particularly well quoted, I think. And, and you're viewed the way that maybe we would view. Aston Villa or no, it's for us. You know, we had a big victory ages ago, but they haven't done very much since. So maybe we would view other teams in Scotland, like Dunfermline, even though you've got a soft spot for Dunfermline, Paul, but how do you view Dunfermline? Big in the 60s, done hee haw since. So we're not viewed as a big country. So if you're if you, if you, a manager in this country, if you're a player in this country, you're not really quoted. And if you go back three years and you say to a, a manager who's never managed in Europe before, how do you fancy managing one of the top six clubs in the richest league in the world and will pay you whatever's getting quoted five to ten million pounds a year and you get to live in one of the most exciting cities in the world? That's a that's a fantasy job. It's an absolute fantasy job. But we can't compete with that. No matter what people say, and I've seen things on social media, give Ange five million a year, give him a ten year. That doesn't come into it at all. Uh, specifically, I hope Ange is here for a long, long time. I think we're really, really lucky. He's an exceptional manager and he's an even better person, which for me means more. I think we're really, really lucky to have the guy here. But if you are successful, then that's going to attract people the way it attracts people to our players. But if, if I'm Ange and you're offered that kind of job, there's nothing that can compete with that. It's an absolute fantasy. And somebody like Ange who's obsessed with football, it's, it's his ultimate fantasy. And if he's offered it, he will take it. My hope is he's not offered it. And that's it. And also the thing is, a lot of this stuff has been driven by the Scottish media mm -hmm. and cup final week. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. And if you read some yeah. of the stuff on social media, it's not getting quoted in London. He's maybe on the, on the short list of people they like to talk to. But in European terms, he's not a big fish. You know, another thing about football managers, like football players, there's a time to go. There's a time where you're at the top of the apex that if you keep on going, so if Ange stays here next year, next year and he wins the league again and doesn't do particularly well in Europe, then his star descends a little bit, you know. And I think he's at the peak of his powers just now. He's came here, revolutionised the club. He can he obviously he can handle a big club where the media level is, or the media scrutiny is ridiculous. So he's shown that he can do that in every country he's been to. So if I'm an EPL my chairman, I'd think I might take a punt on this guy. But I'd expected maybe a kind of Bournemouth or a Palace or something. But for a, a team like Tottenham Hotspur, who have underachieved obviously over a number of years, but they're a huge club, got the best, maybe the best stadium in Europe. I've never been there, I don't know. I've just heard it's really good. But it's a fantasy job, and I just hope he's not offered the job. Uh, but I think you have to look at it in terms of where we are in, in the kind of football food chain until or and if if we ever manage to get out of the Scottish football bubble, then we've got a chance to compete. But while we're in the bubble, 
we're at the top of that food chain, but that's as far as it goes. We can't compete. We really can't compete. And if he goes, he goes with our best wishes because he's such an exceptional character. I think there's a lot of great points, <clears throat> Jim. And uh, one of the, one of the points that we discussed yesterday was, you know, the insistence of the Scottish media. Uh, and you're looking at the Scottish media, which should be talking up your game, almost booking them the flights down to London, Lloyd. You know, mm. you look at some of the headlines that we've we've been looking at this week. And I, I spoke yesterday about the fact that I've gone into these articles because I like to be in possession of all the information at my disposal, as much as it pains me to click on some of these particular news sources. I like to go mm. in and see, right, where are the established facts? Where's the opinion? Where's the quotes? Where's the, the substance to the headline? And quite frankly, there's been very little substance. You know, these yeah, people, they tend detail. to... They, they like to talk as if they're in the know, Lloyd. But when mm -hmm. you look at them and you think, well, no smoke without fire, right? Where's the story coming from? Um, but at this moment in time, when you look at the way it's been reported, it's disappointing. But as Jim says, it's to be expected because that's what happens when Celtic have a big fixture. And we've got a massive fixture tomorrow. Yeah, of course we do. It's, it's kind of distracted away from the cup final a little bit, which is quite disappointing because we're on way to do a record eighth treble and a world record eighth mm -hmm. treble mm -hmm. so why is that not getting spoke about as much the whole thing with Ange going and everything and obviously the Scottish media bamming up to I mean even you've got a certain Rangers pundit coming out today saying he hopes he stays to knock him off his perch I mean it's, I saw that it, I know what, what, what kind of things had to come out with it's, it's baffling but you, you just you do hope, hope that if he stays, he stays, but I think if he's offered it, he's gone. Well, you know, I, I love the the debate. I love the the uh, the two sides of that argument stroke discussion. And you see a lot of it on social media. You, you see a lot of it in the comments section of our bulletin and, and on WhatsApp groups and all that. And it's great because when someone actually argues the point in such a balanced way, it does kind of you know, influence your own thought process. And that happened to me the other day. I've got to say, young James McKenzie was on on Tuesday and he spoke about um, the reasons that Spurs would be a good move on a personal level if you were to remove our love affair with Celtic out of the equation for a moment. And it's hard to even imagine that and think, well, why would he want to go to Spurs? And James spoke about the pros of that move. The flip side, obviously, is there are many cons as well. And I think the first thing you do, right, and the very fact that we're seven and a half, eight minutes deep into this conversation and we've not really spoke about the cup final yet, proves your point, Lloyd. It, it is a shame that it's overshadowing it. But we'll get this part of it covered. We'll, we'll speak to some of the people in the comments section and we'll definitely get to the cup final, no doubt about it. And I think that the, the obvious thing that they can offer is money in terms of your salary, money in terms of a budget for players and the platform of what Jim describes rightly as the richest football league on the planet. It's like the fourth richest sports league on the planet, you know, below the things like the NFL, etc., the NBA. So when they come calling, it's going to be very, very difficult for Celtic in our position to deal with that. What does that mean? Because we love our club, club like no other, uh, fairy tale, great fan base, and all that kind of stuff. Well, you just the, the, the figures don't stack up. So you look mm. at a team like, like Spurs and you say, well, they're in a league, right, that when Norwich City finished bottom of the league last season, they got over £100 million prize money. They then got £41 million quid as a parachute payment. Celtic, for completing Scottish football tomorrow, if they win mm. the treble, will get £4.8 million quid. Now, that puts you on a, a different plane entirely as a football club to try and get into the Champions League. You then look at how you get into the Champions League in Scottish football. You win the league. And by the way, only recently was that an automatic place in the Champions League. How many qualifiers did we have to go through during the nine in a row period? You look at English football and the many places they get. So you've got a team like Spurs that are coming along who have won nothing in the last I think uh, since they won the uh, fifteen the years, cup. I think, is it? yeah, right. nothing in the last decade, right? But in that last decade, they've competed time and time again in the Champions League, and I don't just mean being there. They've been in a final. They've been in three last sixteens. They've played in the group. So in five of the last ten seasons, they've offered a platform 
for someone with ambitions to play at that or manage at that elite level. And that's a huge difference. So you don't even have to win the league, Jim, and you can still play and manage at that level. I've seen people say the coin. I don't see any coins at all. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned that people think there's a coin to go into Manny's Tottenham Hotspur and get paid five to ten million quid a week. And, and people tell you that about you know in the Champions League, if every second week you're going to Old Trafford and the Etihad and Stamford Bridge and oh and, 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 and Anfield, that's Champions League type games that you're having. There's no, I, I can't see any coins at all. People say, well, he may not get the chance. If he doesn't get the chance, he doesn't get the chance. He'll get a multi-million pound payoff and he'll get a job somewhere else. But absolutely, if I manage points to call, there, there are no cones at all. Unless you don't want to live in London, unless there's something from his from his family point of view. But if, I, I, I know I said at the very start, don't talk about it because it may not happen. But if we're having this debate, then he would regret not taking it if he was offered it. The issue here, I think, is has he been offered it if he's not been offered it? If he's not been offered it, we can all relax and enjoy at least one more season of the Ange Costa Coglu show. If he's been offered that, I don't see any cons at all. And if I'm po- if I'm Ange Costa Coglu, and from what I've listened to the guy saying, he's so you'll never get somebody who's as passionate about football as mm. this guy is, and he would regret for the rest of his life. And he's an old young guy compared to me, but he's a fairly old guy, and he would regret not taking that job because this is what he's worked his whole life for. He's built up to this. It has to be a really, really good reason not to take it. Now, if and also, I think he would fancy his chances. I think he, he would think I've got enough confidence, more ability. I've came halfway across the world, took over Celtic, it's a shambles, and I've built them into what I built them into now. I can do the same with Spurs. If I don't get the time, mm-hmm. I, if I don't get the time and I get sacked after three months, hey ho, I've given it a go. I had to give it a go because, as I said, this is, you know, you'll never get a. Chances are Harry will never get a bigger job than Tottenham Hotspur. You know, in terms of world food, again, in that food chain, and that's what you were talking about. The food chain over there, you get hundred million pounds for just coming to the table. You know, we we we're living off the scraps of something. Mm-hmm. As I said, we're outside looking in the window. Until we, if we ever get out of this league, that will always be the case. So you have to accept we are where we are. But when I hear people say, "Well, there's coins of this," I don't see any coins at all. The thing about the Champions League, as you said, Paul, they've competed in the Champions League. You only got to get in the top four. And yet it's more competitive now because obviously Newcastle are now kind of, they've got a bit of dosh to spend. But Spurs are consistently in the top, top six. They're consistently in Europe. They're in the Champions League as well, more often than not. Okay, they're not in it next year, but hey ho. He's a very good fit, I think, for, for, for that, maybe just outside the kind of elite teams down there. A Tottenham, uh, and even something like Everton, I know Everton just scraped by this year, but Everton, are kind of, to me, are a sleeping giant. There's a number of teams down there just out with that top six with, with, with a good history that good fan base could do well. But we're not trying to sell Ange, that's really no the point. Uh, but I just don't see when people say there's cons of, of, of him going down there, from Ange's point of view, I don't, I don't see them. The two that have been mentioned, but again, I think Ange would back himself. The, the two that uh, I've looked at as well are uh, Daniel Levy and the the churn rate of managers. Uh, within that 10-year period, of course, six managers, one of whom was there for five years. Um, the other one would be the, the kind of nature of the reaction of Spurs fans. Now, there's no way that's going to affect Dan's because I think he's had yeah. that probably every step of his managerial career. He certainly mm-hmm. had it coming over, over here. Mm-hmm. So... It, you know, it is a debate. It's going to swing back and forward. But what I'm pinning my hopes on is that um, he actually isn't the number one choice. Just because the bookies have closed the betting, just because the bookies are, are saying that he's the favourite, um, as Jim was saying there, a lot of the the uh, the tabloid headlines are generated north of the border, not down south. So that's what I'm kind of hoping for. Uh, I would much rather see the big fella stay for at least a season and see in a year's time, Jim. I'll yeah. still want him to stay for another year, right? It's it's like the rolling contract. It's not going to change, right? See, next year, I'll still want him for another year, but it will be a little This will never easier. change, Paul. This will never change until he does go. As long as he keeps getting success, that'll be the case. If he stays and if we don't win the league next year, then Spurs are going to come for him next year. And that's why I said a few minutes ago that he's maybe at the peak of his powers just now. There's a good time. It's like the, the guy across the city that left midway through this season. He was at the peak of his powers. He just won the league. Uh, he got him into the Champions League, having to qualify for that. He's at the peak of his powers. He goes down south and he's found out. 
as soon as I knee, he can't get a job now. But that was his peak time to go, and that's why he went. Because mm-hmm. if he stayed any longer, and Ange did win the league against them, then his 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 stars descended as well. So if you're Ange, there's a, there's a peak time to go. Like any football player, there's a, there's, a, there's a peak time to go. When you've done really well, that's your time to go. Because I know I keep talking about a bad every week. Last season, the end of last season, was a bad peak time to go, and he starts a good this season. And I keep thinking, his stats will be good next season, so this is the time for him to go. Personally, I don't want him to go, but personally, there's always an optimum time to go. So, And if you stay too long, as I said, you might uh, impact negatively, you know, how your star is. You know, if we end up winning nothing next year, then he won't have a cure club is looking to get him. So it's a difficult one, but yeah, hopefully he's nowhere near been offered the job. He's been, he's been, he's been shortlisted because, you know, he's, he's he done quite well when he makes a kind of interesting left field person. And the way that we looked at it last no, two years ago now, that we looked, well, I suppose to but when you look to what he's done, you think, mm, maybe that's worth a chance. Maybe that's what they're thinking. But the backlash down there, because it's so cutthroat, because there's so much money involved and you can't afford to miss out, you know, in, in that league. And end up, I mean, look, if, if you look at Everton this season, I mean, what if, what if what Spurs ended up doing that side of the table next season? Anyway, let's let's hope he stays. Right? Let's Hold hope on. he stays. I think they're the fifth EPL club to be linked with Ange Postacoglu this season. And he spoke about that yesterday, Lloyd, when once again he was asked in the press conference on the eve of... Um, a world record treble um, and everything else that's happening this weekend, all the focus is on Spurs. And, and three or four different um, pundits asked him the same question, but they, they worded it in a slightly different way. And Ange has given him that look, Lloyd, that you really don't want to get if you're in that press conference. And and he spoke, and I was saying yesterday, you know, he's, he's kind of been aloof, I think, whenever he's been asked that question all season. Um, but I'm going to ask a few other questions, questions in relation to the game tomorrow. Before I do that, I was driving home yesterday from Glasgow and um, I got a big thumbs up and a wave from Stephen. You know who you are, Stephen, if you're listening. Cheers, mate, um, because it, you're obviously a fan of Axom and it's great when people come up and say that they are a fan. I also got a wee peep when I was in Glasgow and uh, I, I was flipped the bird. So I don't know if they're an Axom fan or if they're a fan of some other football team out there. But that's the thing that happens, isn't it, when you're just bouncing about Glasgow, minding your own business. Um, Xander Mack, you wouldn't think Celtic are going for a world record eighth domestic treble. Oh, look, a squirrel. Right, <laughs> let's talk about tomorrow then, right? First thing I want to talk about is, yeah, it's a world record. It's an incredible achievement should we get there. Um, it's a huge 90 minutes, and once you get through that 90 minutes, Ange Postacoglu and every member of that team and staff connects themselves into the Celtic history books, Lloyd. Mm-hmm. Yet, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how do you celebrate? Have we all got to go home um, into the confines of our own homes and uh, you know play music at a, a reasonable level and just enjoy it that way? Or can we go out and celebrate? No, we go out and celebrate. Same as we, last week? We, oh, yeah, same as last week, all over again. What do you think of the Ferrari? I know you were in the heart of it. I've seen some of your images. Yeah. What did you What did you make of the, the fallout after that last week, Lloyd? You were leading that... it, Lloyd, as far as... It was. He was one of the guys in the traffic lights. You were the front. You were the guy at the front. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be honest. My, my head probably sticks above most folk anyway. I'm that tall anyway, so... But, no, I, I, I thought some of it was just over the top. I mean, 10 arrests at Big Gatherum. Really? Is that what we're actually going to talk about and put in the press in a statement for the police? Ten I know, arrests. I know. It's it's bewildering. Let's go back to let's go back to Jim because Jim shared some incredible footage with us uh, from twenty years ago. Jim, fairly recently, it's on the channel and it's in an interview that we did with you, The Road to Seville. Brilliant interview, I've got to say, by you, know the guy asking you the questions, and great content, great footage from Seville. But there's a point where you're walking along the street, right? And that is revered and renowned for being a success. Celtic going over the 80,000 fans, winning um, international awards for our behaviour, Jim. But you're walking along streets that are covered in litter. There's people lying drunk. Of course there is. But that's just what happens. What was the difference, Jim, between that and the celebrations in Glasgow last week? Because I feel that Celtic and Celtic fans have been vilified for it. Yeah, I think it's a really good question, and I think there's kind of two parts to it, I think. Uh, you've, if you're going to have a celebration and you know it's going to come, you should plan for it, I think. And that's, that's, that's number one. 
And number two is how people react after it's finished. And I think in terms of the planning for it, and also, you know, I think if you're successful, you should celebrate. You should celebrate achievements. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go a bit over the top. I don't mean behaviour. I just mean like we won the league most seasons. So you know, should you go absolutely you know mental by because you won the league? Uh, if you win a European trophy, you can go absolutely you know, do what you want, as far as I'm concerned. So there's a bit of a kind of balance there, I think. I also think that <clears throat> it does affect other people's businesses and other people's lives if you take over a whole kind of area. And I think as a club, we should have looked to do something at Celtic Park and in the area around Celtic Park. I don't know how this works from a local authority point of view, but could you could you cordon off a whole area? Could, could you could you could you lease something? Could you, could you bring in bars or temporary things and just just have a thing within Celtic Park because the game finishes last week. I wasn't at the game. I was doing it. Corby. That's the first first match they missed all season. But but basically, keep it within the confines of Celtic Park. But you need some entertainment there. You need some facilities there. You need place for people to go and have something to eat and have a and, and have a and have a beverage. You know. I would keep it around Celtic Park if we could. And we knew that was going to be trophy day last week. So, so we could have done something, I think, around mm -hmm. the Celtic Park. Once you take into the town centre and other people's, where people live, etc. I love quite near Hamden Park. And, uh, you know, you can say, well, you choose to stay near Hamden Park. Therefore, you know there's going to be big matches on. But some of the stuff, particularly pop concerts, you know, is just atrocious. You know, antisocial behaviour. Etc. Etc. So I've got a wee kind of vested interest in that. I know what it's like to live next to a big stadium when there's big events on. So I've got sympathy with the people who have to endure that. Uh, and I'd like to see the club do something, just keep it within the confines of Celtic Park. That's our, that's our home ground, that's our spiritual home. Have a big celebration there, but, but, but have facilities that bring in stuff. I'd like to see that. The second point is the reaction to it. Of course it's way over the top. Of course mm -hmm. it's that number of arrests, you know, you'll get that, I don't know, in a small village in the Saturday night in Glasgow, eh, not in Glasgow, in somewhere in Scotland, and you'll get that in, you know, Bathgate or Cold Bridge or something like that. You know, it's just... Kelty. It's just, you'll get more than 10 in Kelty. Sorry, in any of our fans listening. <laughs> Kelty. I love Kelty. In some village in Fife, you'll get 10 arrests in a Saturday night. So it's no many arrests, but when people all leave the scene and the debris lying there, it, it isn't a good look. You know, so I think there's a bit of a kind of balance in that here that I think big celebrations, if you win something significant, brilliant, go out and celebrate. Uh, but try not to impact on people who are not there to celebrate, whose life might be impacted, and clean up after you go, if that's at all possible. But I think that's why if you kept it within the confines of Celtic Park, I think that's a better solution. And my concern, being the old boring negative guy, is that... Once you start doing stuff like this, you know, we've won the league, but we won the league, how many times now is that? 53? You know, are we the most... Are you counting there, Jim? No, but I just wonder whether we're the world's most successful club yet. I don't know. People keep telling me that's about to happen. So in the confines of a Scottish football bubble, apparently that's where we are. But winning the league is, is a fairly, uh, you know, we do it quite a lot. So is that a time to go absolutely bonkers when we win the league? The old boring negative guy would say, no, it isn't. The treble, I've done trebles before. So, celebrate, by all means celebrate. If we win the European trophy, not sell out, do whatever you want. You know, but so I mean I'm I'm an older person, so I don't get involved in the younger Lloyd type, you know, he's with, with his, climbing uh, traffic lights. Pyros and climbing traffic lights and jumping on top of bus shelters. You know, that's not my thing. But by all means, celebrate. Uh, but I think if we kept it within the confines of Celtic Park, that would be good. Because then people then, I don't think, can have a dig because it's all within your own area. I think when you start mm -hmm. to impact in other people's areas, then we know that, you know, should we not win the league next year? Heaven forbid. We know what's going to happen in Glasgow City Centre next May. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But we've now set a kind of, this is how, if you win the league, this is what you do. And we'll know... Mm -hmm they will do that at some point in the future and we'll get annoyed at that because this is terrible what they're doing. So I think you have to maybe look at it from a different perspective sometimes, not just from a Celtic point of view, but what would you feel like if you lived in that area, you had a business in that area and it's been swamped by people? So there's a balance in that. But in terms of the press reporting that, yeah, it's way over the top because, as I said, in some village in Dalkeith, where, where the studio is, I'm sure you'll get 10 every Saturday night, yeah, no bother. 
Yeah, you're, you're right. Now, <clears throat> I like the idea, Lloyd, that Jim says there of keeping it contained and confined, but also like managing it for the fans. So, for example, you see how well organised Celtic supporters can be. You know, you've seen mm -hmm. the TFOs, for example. We are a, a, a fan base that can stabilise and get things organised and get things done. But if the club were also to, to be part of that, and if there was a, an area which would be a fan zone, but again, I think that um, there has been challenges with that, isn't there? I mean, there has been applications yeah. made to, to do it officially and they keep getting knocked back. So it seemed almost last week uh, as something of a contradiction, right? So you won't give us a fan area, a fan zone, even within your own stadium footprint. You won't give us a fan zone where we can sell alcohol and we can have live music and all this kind of stuff because that would be like perfect, especially with the sun shining. It would be absolutely perfect. You're not giving us that. Um, and then we decide to go and do something impromptu and you're not giving us that. So, you know, it, is, seems, it does seem to be a difficult balancing act and hopefully the club and the authorities can can come to some kind of agreement uh, for such times that, uh, you know, we do it again because it will happen again. Yeah, it will happen again. And it's about time maybe the club and also the Glasgow City Council do start speaking about it because fan zones are something that's going to need to come to fruition if we keep going out celebrating league title wins every year. So, I know obviously the this club are doing something on Saturday with regarding a stage at the stadium. So, they're preparing for people going back to the stadium after on Saturday. So, things like that can be organised and it can be policed quite well. Because you've seen that when we won the league the other week, loads of fans turned up at the stadium. There was no bother. People were just merry celebrating. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be. No, I think right. also that, I mean, I'm not looking for a, a, a permanent fan zone. I just think last Saturday was, was it something that there was going to be, you know, 60,000 fans are going to be there. There's actually lots of the area around Celtic Park. Uh, the, the streets get blocked off. London Road gets blocked off. Dalmarnock Road gets blocked off. Nothing happens. You've got the Celtic way. So there's things there. And as I said, I don't know the ins and outs of how you go about doing this kind of stuff. But if you just put a big barrier around the whole thing, brought in some catering, brought in some drinks companies, brought in some whatever you want to do. And as you said, Paul, you make it a big thing. You're bouncy castle if you went for Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you could, you, there's so much you could do with me, but I thought, what are we doing? We're building a wooden stage. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's it. We're building a wooden stage. You know, so I think there's a lack of foresight, a lack of thought. And I'd have thought the city council would be totally on board in that, because what you're basically saying is we're keeping everyone out of the city centre. Yep. Or keep them within the confines of Celtic Park. We'll clear out the rubbish. Don't you worry. As I said, I don't know logistically or planning wise and all that, so how that would work. But to me, it seems like a kind of dead simple idea because there's so much land around about there and the roads are all closed off. You know yourself, there's, there's no traffic in and around Celtic Park. You can't get near Celtic Park. So, and the Celtic Way is pretty big as well. You should put things in the Celtic Way because I'm assuming they own the Celtic Way. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Exactly. I just exactly. think that's what you should be doing. The Clover, I think, is uh, definitely a good space to build a stage if that's where they're doing it. Because I've, I've said that a few times. And, you know, on match day, there should be a stage on the Clover. And we've got loads of talented people. I wouldn't mind seeing some of the musicians uh, on there performing. And um, we've got uh, Clav's 1978 Bookie Savanja, one to three, to be an experts manager. I just hope they are wrong. They can be wrong. They were wrong with how His comments seemed very positive yesterday. So just hope he stays. What I'm doing class and anyone <coughs> else who is concerned is I'm sticking to what we hear from Ange Postacoglu because up until this point, there is no reason, right, for us not to believe him. Now, the same couldn't be said for the bold Brendan Rodgers because, Jim, were you at the gig where I interviewed Danny McGrain at the Royal Concert Hall in Glasgow? It was indeed, yes. 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 And this was in the January, right? So Brendan Rodgers is still the manager of Celtic. Danny McGrain is still on the coaching staff at Celtic, and Danny tells us the real story of when Eamon Holmes asked Brendan Rodgers about him arriving, and then obviously he seen Danny McGrain standing on the corner of a training pitch, Lennox Town, and he went over, and the rest, as they say, is kind of made-up history by Brendan Rodgers. And Danny McGrain told us that story at the time. So there was, there was moments where you started to disbelieve what Brendan had told us in the past. There's never been such a time with Ange. Everything he said is checked out. So let's believe what Ange says. In Ange we trust. Have we not been saying that all season? So yeah. that is where I am with it. Let's talk about the cup final uh, tomorrow. After a few poor displays, and by the way, Lloyd, I was interested to hear Ange talking about those displays yesterday. Took it on the chin. 
This is what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. He took it on the chin. He took the blame for it. He says that um, in any walk of life, in terms of you know elite sports, once you reach that pinnacle, if you like, and you've won the league, it's just natural to drop off. And he tried to change it up and mix it up by bringing in some of the fringe players who hadn't played games. It didn't work. He says it's on him. Great. But the performance against Aberdeen was basically Celtic back to our best under Ange. And I want to start off, correct me if I'm wrong, tell me if you, you see any other wild cards. I think there's really only two um, areas of that park that we need to discuss. The first one being the central defensive area, who partner Starfield. Um, so I'm going to start with that. We've seen a bit of Kobayashi. We've seen a lot of flack coming his way. Uh, incidentally, during the three games that Ange mentioned yesterday, where we as a team were not at our, our best, and we've seen a water coming in, and I would suggest one good performance against Aberdeen and one not so good performance uh, previous to that. So, who starts with Carol Starfield for you, Lloyd, tomorrow? After being at the game on Saturday, I would say a water looks more composed beside Starfield, and he looks as if he can deal with being the partner there. At, Aberdeen didn't really put much pressure on him last week, right enough. But I do think he's he's a bit more confident than what Kobe Ash is at the minute. Mm-hmm. It does come down to confidence, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't want to write off Kobe Ash, twenty two years of age. He's clearly been brought in uh, as a long term option. Uh, but when we look at that defence, we know how much we miss Carter Vickers. Uh, Jim, we tried to bring Kobe Ash in. It wasn't seamless. We've tried a water played well against Aberdeen. There's Stephen Welsh, who's out the picture, been been sitting on the bench. I don't think you bring him back in. How do you play it? Who do you play alongside Carol Starfield? I think the last three games have been like end of season friendlies, and I wouldn't read too much into the games. I think the more, I think the last time I was on before was before the St Mirren game, and I said the old Alec Ferguson quote: "It's attackers win your games and defenders win your leagues." Because we've got a good defence. Your forwards are really confident, and we've had a really good defence this year. So if you're Jota, 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 if you're Jota or Kyogo and these kind of guys, you know that we score one or two goals, we win the game. But if you're not very confident in your defence and you lose two or three goals, you're thinking, well, we need to score three or four to win this game. And the St Mirren game, when the Water and, and Wilson kind of bumped into each other and then the ball, and Hart let the ball under his, under his body in the first few minutes, that just gives St Mirren so much confidence, thinking, actually, they're not very good. <laughs> And Maine could have scored five that day, albeit meaningless end of season friendly type thing. But if you don't have a solid goalkeeper and don't have a solid centre half, then it's a bit weird. And that was, even though it was three meaningless end of season friendlies for me, I think the big takeaway was the concern about the centre half if Carter Vickers isn't playing, and maybe the goalkeeper as well, because Joe Hart didn't cover himself with glory and Scott Bain came in and made that mistake. Up to that point, he was actually doing okay, but you're thinking, don't know, a bit worried. Uh, Kobe Yashi was brilliant at Ibrox, was brilliant at Easter Roads, and Inverness will fancy their chances at set pieces tomorrow. Uh, I know we'll, we'll talk maybe a bit more detail about, about them later, but he looks somebody who is maybe from, from a physical point of view just not there yet. Iwata, uh, as I said, a meaningless, a meaningless game last week. Don't know, it didn't look too clever against St Mirren. I don't think either of them are a particularly good choice, and if Welsh is out the picture, uh, yeah, that is a concern tomorrow, but I think, like Lloyd said, I think I want to get the nod last week. I don't know if that was because Kobayashi was, was injured or whatever, but was he injured last week, Kobayashi? Wasn't in the squad. No, he wasn't, he, was, he wasn't in the squad, but he wasn't mentioned. You know, Ange normally gives you that update. This week, it's the only person that's not going to be available is going to be Moy. Um, he did talk about Kyogo, and we'll come to Kyogo, but he normally gives you that update if there is anyone with an ankle, and he, he never mentioned Kobayashi. If he's out the squad all together and he wasn't injured, then you think he's no chance of playing. Otherwise, they kept him on the bench last week, just to be involved. So that points to Iwata. Uh, yeah, it just shows that without the big man at the back, uh, it's a bit of a concern moving forward to next to next season. Uh, but yeah, I think Iwata's kind of last man standing, I think. So it's got to be him. Mm. It, it is a, a wee bit of a concern that he's the last man standing because there is only one central defender injured. Um, obviously, Kobayashi came in, wasn't ideal. Awata's playing uh, in his non-preferred position. And I agree, I would play Awata. And I think the back five, other than that, is what you would expect. Um, with Joe Hart, Johnston, who I think came in and played really well. He spoke well yesterday as well, talking about the fact that, you know, 
and this is what influenced and inspired the tagline today, uh, shutting out the noise um, because he says it just wouldn't be accepted. Never mind by Ange, but he mentioned Callum McGregor wouldn't accept that kind of chat either. So it's all about focusing on the game. If you disagree with that in relation to the centre-halves, let us know and let me know your reasoning as well. Whose news comes in? 26 people were arrested at a Coldplay gig in Glasgow. Nobody sanctioned mm-hmm. Coldplay. Yeah. Were they arrested going into it? Is what I ask because I mean, Coldplay, seriously. I mean, what are they going to get? I wasn't on the bouncy castle that night. <laughs> were you at the gig? I was at that gig, yeah. You want to Ooh, he's a discussion. That? He's Come a discussion. On. Now. We'll open that up. No, nah, I'm only kidding. No. I'll just sit thought... back and watch you two guys. On you go. <laughs> I actually <laughs> thought, uh, I thought that the first couple of albums were good, and obviously they go around and they, they pull a big crowd. But great point. 26 arrests, and that, that's the kind of thing you're going to see at uh, mm-hmm. festivals, um, at uh, processions, I think their correct name is, um, i.e. O'Keefe, Orange yeah, Walks. Yeah, 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 you get all that kind of stuff, and there's plenty of arrests, yet Celtic were absolutely vilified last week. Um, Pete McGee takes us to the wingers, same team as last week, say for Maeda and for Abada. If the latter is injured, he did come off at half time, didn't he, Jim? A bad. I thought I had a very good half against Aberdeen. Don't know if you had a chance to watch it back. Yeah, I watched all game back. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the team picks itself. I think Jota, Kyogo, Maeda. That's that's the team up front. Lloyd, that's would you agree team. or disagree? I, I did. I was impressed with Abada. He's not been named on the injury list by Ange, but um, I think in terms of consistency, that Maeda this season would be my first pick. I think he's been far more consistent than Abada. Yeah, he has been. I, I Maeda had a great 45 minutes last week, but Maeda's worked right enough for the team. I'm choosing Maeda over Abada. And um, when he when he did what he did against Hibs, it was almost as if he was possessed, Lloyd. I've never seen that in him. But I was talking to Liam about it during the week there, and he says that uh, he does have that. He's got that nasty kind of streak in him. And uh, it's the first time I've seen it. Now, sometimes I think that's okay if you can channel it. But um, it was pretty obvious to everybody uh, that he was going to get sent off. It was like he was Apart determined. Apart from Ange, obviously. Apart from <laughs> Ange. You had a chance to take him off. And I know it's it's no great for any footballer to, to be subbed on and then subbed off. I remember we Joe, Joe Miller, Jim, can you remember that game? Billy McNeil subbed him on against Aberdeen and then took Chats him back Joe off. last night, yeah. Chats Joe Miller last night, yeah, absolutely. Right, that's a perfect segue into last night, Jim. Tell us all about it. Where were you? What were you up to? Hey, it was a kind of pre-Vegas... Ben and Bertie, because we're off to Vegas on Sunday. Uh, ben and Bertie's on, and on Tuesday. Uh, but three weeks today, excited. We're at Celtic Park for for Ben and Brat back, and uh, to play Celtic Park is going to be great because uh, after tomorrow there's no football for a couple of months. So if you want your Celtic fix, uh, Ben and Brat back at the Kerry Deal Suite, and uh, could be the last time it's on because uh, brought it back for the 25th anniversary of a of a special season. Because uh, I know we owe the Lisbon Lions so much, but we also owe that team. So much as well, because uh, as I've said before, uh, they wouldn't have stopped at 10, they'd have been 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you name a number. So a very special team, a very special manager, uh, plays funny <clears throat> all the way through. Uh, best best Celtic play Joe Miller's scene, best Celtic play John Fallon's scene. So if you can get along to the, the Kerry Dale suite, and oh, this is a shameless plug, obviously. <laughs> Three weeks tonight for, for Ben Lett Brat back, because I think, as I said, this may be the, the last time we have it on. So uh, that's my plug. There's your plug. And by the way, the link to that play is underneath the video. Uh, We've got to celebrate, like you say, Jim, we've got to celebrate success and we've got to celebrate talent. And Jim Moore is indeed a very talented playwright. So very modest as well. So yeah, get on it. I I mean, get on that link underneath. And, And when you were saying there, it's maybe the last time that people will get a chance to see it. I'm in that situation whereby... All my books, except my, my latest one, are out of print, Jim. But I think it's a good thing just to leave them that way and just leave them kind of out there. So all the copies that are out there are the only ones you can get. And you, there I won't think be a, if you, if another... You, if you get some, nah, yeah, I think if you get something like a play that's about Bertie O, there's a Bertie O bit in it, that's kind of timeless, you mm-hmm. know, and you've seen the mm-hmm. play polls, so that's actually a bit of a clue in, in terms of the timelessness of the of the Bertie O bit. But that back is about a season and... It's because it's an anniversary, 25th anniversary. Would I do one for the 30th? I'll be too old then to do that kind of stuff. So I think this will be the last one and then we'll just leave it. So if you've not seen it before, it's really, really funny. The actors are phenomenal in it. And uh, so get along to Kerry Dale three weeks time. 
You know, the, the other thing I was going to say is uh, yesterday I was talking to Simon Donnelly and we mentioned the gig, you know, they did recently, you were at it, Jim. Uh, they yeah. were trying to get the Harold Bratt back over. He was like, he couldn't get the yeah. day off work. He couldn't get the day off work. He was flying planes that night. Oh, fantastic. He was a I, unique character. Because I'd asked him to come to the one in three weeks' time, but he's in France flying that. And he's thinking, but you're Harold Bratt back. You'll just say, I'm having a day off. I know he scored against Lloyd. Real Madrid in the Champions mm-hmm. League for Rosenberg. And, Super. and AC Milan as well. So, I mean, he's kind of, uh, yeah, he's a real kind of, uh, he's a guy that scored the goal. So, so, I mean, it's not play about did. him. That would be a very short play, but it was a play about Harold Brambach, you know. So, play about the season, hysterically funny. That's my last plug. That's, that's what there I'm we doing. go. Go along and see it. Now, Definitely. I also want to talk about if Kyogo doesn't make it tomorrow, right? Now, Kyogo is our kind of cup final king. He's played two cup finals for Celtic Lloyd. He scored a double on each occasion. Um, you know, we'll look back on that. I remember growing up, and getting the old Celtic videos and, you know, you had cup finals and there was the Dixie Deans cup finals, you know, plural. There was the cup final when Andy Lynch scores the the penalty. And as you're a wee fan doing all that retrospectively, you know, maybe in 20 years' time, it won't be a VHS video, of course. If people will look back on Kyogo, he, he just scored a double in, the, in two League Cups in a row. This is his third cup final. Um, he's only starting to train today. I don't know if Angel will give out any more information if he speaks to the press today, but there is a slight concern over whether or not he's going to make it. I'm going to ask you the question. I want him to make it, obviously. I'm going to ask you the question, though. If O has to come in, right, and I know even just a couple of weeks back, Lloyd, people were talking mm-hmm. about O being a downgrade and all this on Yakimakis. Three starts for Celtic. Um, he's 22 years of age. In three starts, he scored seven goals, which equates to a goal every 80 minutes on the park. Um, would you be pretty confident, in particular, after that, that performance against Aberdeen, if the big man had to lead the line? If Ola needs to lead the line, I'd be confident enough in him doing it. Fine, it's Kyogo's Kyogo. You, you know what you get from him all the time. It's Obviously, O's coming in January transfer window. You're not really sure what he's made of. He's still a bit raw. To be honest with you, I think he just really needs a good pre-season under his belt. But his goal per game ratio is probably, I think, better than Kyogo's. So it's if he needs to lead the line tomorrow, then I'd be fine with that. But all fingers crossed that Kyogo does make it. Fingers. And talk about a different team with Kyogo in the starting lineup, mm-hmm. Jim. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. I think the, the word that Lloyd used there that I'm, I'm going to focus on is raw. Uh, because the big fella does look at he looks like a, a bit of rough diamond, doesn't he? Football's a habit of having unlikely heroes, and you know, wouldn't you surprise me if if Ole comes in tomorrow and scores a couple of goals, and he's a he's the guy that secures the treble. But yeah, we want Kyogo to play. Obviously, we want Kyogo to play because he, he would cause defences all sorts of all sorts of bother. But uh, the one takeaway from the last three end of season friendlies was that centre defence, but also the fact Ole played really well as well. So that was that was quite encouraging. That's I think that's the two things I took from the three games that defence the question mark and all look no but I took he took his goals really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Easter Road game really well swivelled and turned and uh, two goals last week he took really well. So he's a he's a good bit of form, his confidence must be high and if he was told he's going to lead the line in the cup final to win the treble, he was absolutely buzzing. So yeah. It also gives that bit, bit, bit of physicality because Inverness will be no fancy himself at set pieces tomorrow. So uh, yeah, so yeah. Fingers crossed for the wee man, but if he doesn't, I'm pretty sure he'll do, he'll, he'll do okay. And that'll be a headline's dream if he becomes the hero. No, it would of be. All you want, you know, so. Exactly. And, and you're talking about unlikely heroes. I, I guess Andy Lynch was probably that unlikely hero back in 77. Yeah. Uh, Pierre Doombe against Doombe, yeah, yeah, Doombe, yeah. 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 Doombe. So, so it does happen from time to time. And I think with, with O, I, I thought he played really well against Hibs Lloyd. Um, Rangers stands out, but he had a great chance and he hits the post. But then against St. Minnan, uh, when he came on, he had that brilliant shot from about 25 yards after uh, turning on a sixpence. So I, I do think that there's mm-hmm. been signs there that, you know, he's one for the future. But again, sorry to, to bring in the kind of negative aspect of this. One of the players who has been rumoured to have interest from the Bundesliga is Kyogo. Um, and I think that if that were to be the case, even with O's promise, even with what we've seen and what we've just said, there is a, a huge drop-off if a player like Kyogo leaves the club. Uh, and I think that Ange has already spoken about how you progress as a football club. 
and it's and it's um, season by season improvements. You can't go out there and full scale change it all in one transfer window. And it would feel it would feel definitely like a step back, um, quite a few steps back if you were to lose a player like Hugo. Uh, and you would need to replace him, and it couldn't be replacing somebody on potential, could it? It would it would need to be a player of real quality. And we don't have somebody in the door that we've already had a, a chance to look at, like you know previously where we had Jota in for a year and we'd had uh, Carl Vickers in for a year and you think, right, the investment's going to be worth it. But it, it could be that level of investment you're, you're talking about if you need to bring someone in for Kyogo in the pre-season. Yeah, definitely. It's, you're looking <clears throat> at eight, ten million for someone to replace Kyogo. So can we really afford to then go out and spend that kind of money on someone who's just potential? You need a first-team starter in there because Kyogo's so key to this team in the way we play. So that, you can't just rely on O. You can't put Maeda up front or even Abada if he's still there. So really you can't lose Kyogo. He's probably one of the key players in the summer that you don't want to lose. I think he is key. And when we have recently, Jim, gone out and made that that big signing, as I say, for Carter Vickers, for Jota, and then previous to that, for Edward, we have tended to have a look, a try before you buy, if you like, and we've had them in on loan first. Um, but that that is something that is concerning me a wee bit over and above the Ange rumours, is that he's already alluded to the fact, Jim, that uh, one or two might be leaving Celtic Park over the summer. Um, do we have the do we have the fibre in the board to, to deal with that? Do we will we be giving the manager the backing to make sure that they're sufficiently replaced? So I think I'm the old negative guy. I think you have to watch. <laughs> we don't start talking. We might lose this guy. We might lose that guy because it may never happen. So if it happens, it happens. Hey ho! And that's one of the the consequences of having a good manager and good players that they're going to attract interest from someone. And if it happens, it happens. And We'll just have to kind of deal with it as and when it happens. Uh, again, hopefully all our top players are still here next season. But the reality is that some of them have had fantastic seasons. And Hatati's been unbelievable for me. So if somebody comes and wants to buy them and we get top dollar for them, then hey ho. Again, as I said at the very start of the podcast, that's the football food chain that we're in. Basically, and you have to kind of deal with that. Yeah, we want quality. We know if Kyogo's there next season, he'll score 20 goals. If he keeps injury free, he'll score 20 goals guaranteed. If O's going to lead the line next year, we don't know what's going to happen. And that's what you don't want. You don't want uncertainty. And the point I think I made last time I was on about Yakimakis and oh, in the here and now, Yakimakis is a more dependable player. But moving forward, who knows? Because O may end up being twice the player Yakimakis is. And when you're trying to win league championships, it's the here and now that you need players. And we've won the league and it's okay and that's absolutely fine. Moving forward to next season, we need a couple of strikers who you can depend on to score more than 20 goals a season. And we need defenders who you're confident enough are going to have shutouts more often than not. So that's the two key areas of the pitch. If we lose players, we lose players. And the beauty of having somebody like Ange Postacoglu there, he's three or four steps ahead. He's already mm-hmm. planning well ahead. And if he goes, he's got plans in place, whoever is going to take over from him. But he's well ahead of the game. And if a big chap stays, I'm pretty confident, you know, if somebody leaves, we've got somebody better coming in. The, the, the sort of Alistair Johnson scenario, as it was, we left, you know, a guy who was playing for the the country that was the third in the World Cup there, he goes and we bring in somebody who's, I think, most people think is a better player. Now, in the here and now, is a better player, a better defender, and we'll only get better. And when we sell him, hopefully in a long, long time, we'll get a lot of money from him. So, so Angie's well ahead of the game, and that's what a manager's all about. It's about, not the here and now, it's about planning for the future as well. And hopefully we keep all the best players, hopefully we keep our manager, and we go from strength to strength next season. I like the positivity, Jim. Yeah, you see how he I know negative guys me. outside. Ah, he's he's outside. Yeah. Ah, he, he combated my wee negative twist there, Lloyd, Aye. by turning it right round on me. Brilliant, Red Scotland. Welcome back. Uh, you're on the YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube and, and you like what Axon does, then give us a big thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to comment um, as well. We've got lots and lots happening over the preseason into the new season. The bulletin will remain 12:30 every single weekday and also cover the match days. But there are other shows that are in the works. I'm just setting a wee setup outside that I'm looking at through the window. That's going to be on your screens very, very shortly. And all the content, of course. It's absolutely free. Um, 
Red Scotland. Kobe looked a bit ragged, but the guy needs a chance. I was maybe a bit harsh on him previously. Um, it is interesting that he was removed entirely from the squad, as Lloyd said earlier on. Uh, Tim Billy. Inverness will play a battering ram up front. Awata, a bit lightweight. Jim has already mentioned, Lloyd, that um, there will be a, a definitely a, an issue or a worry or a concern. One of their strengths might be the, the set pieces. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about Inverness as an opponent. What are you expecting tomorrow? I'm expecting Inverness to be a bit physical, maybe play for fouls, and also, as Jim said, play for set pieces, because I think that might be the only place they can actually hurt us at all, because I think if they attempt to even play out for the back, and they'll just get ripped apart by us. So they need to play to their strengths, just as we also need to play to ours. You know, I look at that game against Aberdeen and where they stand in our league, Jim, and, and obviously they're one of the better sides. Of course, they've had a strange season, uh, probably the worst result in their history. And then Barry Robson comes and stabilises everything, does really well, gets the job permanently and well-deserved. And he comes across really well as a manager and I hope he does really well until obviously he plays mm. us. But we were able to dismantle that Aberdeen side um, and to the tune of five goals. Inverness, sixth in the championship, not in the playoff spots. Yeah, they're here, they're, they're in the final, they're, they've done it, but obviously they scraped through against Queen's Park due to an administrative error on the part of a, a registration form for one of the Queen's Park players. But they're there mm. and we're facing them. But I do think that we could dismantle this side. And it's not a disrespectful thing to say. I just, I know the quality that Celtic have. And I think that uh, Anne spoke yesterday about Hamden and his record at Hamden and enjoying playing at Hamden because that's that's been a concern for a long, long time. I've never liked the stadium ever since I was there for a whole season back in 94, 95. But there's been a few performances and results there that obviously would add to that, Jim. So talk to me about tomorrow um, and about Celtic and, and what we can achieve against this side. Because, yeah, they will try to be physical. They'll try and be defensive and keep their shape. But I think we've got too much quality and I think we will pick them apart. I mean, you can get into cliches for cup finals. It's a one-off tie, a one mistake, a refereeing decision. Uh, it's a game of their lives. You know, they'll be in the short window. They'll leave nothing on the park and all the other kind of cliches that I'm sure people mention over the next couple of days. But as you said, even though it's an end-of-season friendly, Aberdeen wouldn't want to get hammered last week. They wouldn't want to lose 5 nothing at Celtic Park. And that's the third best team in the top league. And as you said, Inverness didn't even qualify for the playoffs. They've not had a game, a competitive game, in the last month. Uh, in terms of quality, individually and collectively, Celtic are on a different planet altogether. So, the theory is that we should get there and win comfortably. But the other cliche of football is about the first 20 minutes or so. So, if they can keep it tight and we don't score in the first 20 minutes, then they'll get a wee bit of confidence from that. As Lloyd said, they'll try and play... For set pieces, they maybe play a bit more physicality, a bit more balls in the air, and whatever, which can potentially hurt us. Uh, but uh, we're overwhelming favourites. And if you can't go into the game tomorrow with a chance to make history, I'm sure that's the kind of speech that Ange will come away with. Again, seeing some of the stuff he's done in the past, about the chance to make history, eighth treble, most successful team in Scotland, or the world, or the universe, whatever the, we're going to be. So, yeah, I mean, we should be massive favourites going to the game. Uh, None of the Inverness players will go on the Celtic bench. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, we should. Be. And that's no disrespect to Inverness. They'll go and, and you know, they'll, they will leave nothing on the on the park. They will, they will you know, but we'll have 90% of the fans here as well, which will make a huge difference. It's going to be a really sunny day tomorrow. It's just it's just all set up. And if we score in the first 20 minutes, I think, yeah, I think we're going to win the game quite convincingly. Yeah. Now, now uh, Lloyd, you're a wee bit younger than myself, but the treble, right? Uh, now, Jim, obviously, is just a tiny little bit, like a few old years old. older than me, Aye, just a wee bit. Um, but what we do have in common is that we've enjoyed every treble since the Martin O'Neill um, era. Obviously, when he did it, it was a time of incredible change. You, you know, it was a, there was a sea change. I mean, even if you just think about how we won the league there, there was a 25-point swing, um, obviously, mm -hmm. on the previous season. Lloyd like Celtic were pretty shambolic, it's got to be said. Um, and not just for a season. It wasn't just one of those one-season things where everything went wrong. We'd had this period of success. We had won the league in the season that Jim has covered um, in his play, uh, Bend It Like Bratback. 
And then obviously we had a couple of seasons of the likes of Joe Vengloss and then John Barnes and there was players coming and going. So the job Martin O'Neill did was unbelievable and he didn't just win the league, he won the treble and it was a, an incredible achievement. And then we had that that period of four in a row, you know. Um, and I'm not going to ever say that you, you become complacent, <clears throat> but the very fact that we're going for the fifth in seven years, it, it, it doesn't matter what people think about Scottish football. It really doesn't. It could be on any, you know, any sport in the land. That level of consistency, that level of achievement has to be lauded. It has to be applauded. It has to be celebrated. Um, and tomorrow, I think, like like Jim said, I'd love to be a fly in the wall in that dressing room and how Ange is going to get that. I don't think, it was like Johnston yesterday talking about, listen, McGregor tells us before it even gets to Ange, you know. I don't think they need told, but it would be great to hear what that pre-match team talk is going to sound like. It would be very interesting just to get a whisper. It's like you say, Paul, it's five trebles in seven years. Could you ever possibly imagine that? Never. Really? No. I don't, I don't think anyone could. So the achievement itself that we're possibly going for this needs to be celebrated. And this is why we should all just enjoy tomorrow for what it is. Because we're standing literally... In history, in terms of an eighth treble. I thought you were going to say we're standing, the standing on the shoulders of giants. Oh, I thought it, that's it, what... it, it was close to coming. It was very close to coming, <laughs> but no. Do we oh, know the, what the plans are with the Green Brigade? Has that been announced in relation to TIFO or, or what's plans for tomorrow? I've not seen anything, Jim. No, I've not seen anything. No, not seen anything. I, I know that you're you've got your finger on the pulse with these things. Now, I ab <laughs> about next season then, about next season, right? We don't know at this moment what's going to transpire with Ange Postecoglou. Of course we don't. We've been talking about it all week. We've got to talk about it. By the way, people, you know, there's two ends of the scales. People are mildly worried right through to um, almost hysterical about the Ange Postecoglou situation. And that's what being obsessed with Celtic does to you or any football <coughs> Um So... You know, you're going to have to know who's in charge before you can start planning for next season. But, Jim, what do we do? Um, I mean, I'm looking at the the ins and outs. There's going to be plenty of that. I read this morning James McCarthy might be going to the States. I think it's a great move for him. We've been hearing Albion Ayeti will be coming back into the building. Uh, Sturm Graz do not want to make that a permanent move. Um, you know, Vil the Sealers Barkas could be on his way out. I'm pretty sure there'll be quite a few on their way out on the fringes of Celtic squad. And there might be one or two of the top players on the way out as well. So next season, looking ahead, Jim, how do you build on this? I mean, you don't generally expect to be winning treble after treble after treble. What's your expectations? Because I've always said, right, the league, that's your priority. I want a domestic cup on top of that. If you're a Celtic manager, that's your expectations. And you want to improve season on season in Europe. That would be my expectations next season. What about you? I think at half past eight tomorrow night after we've won the treble, Ange will be planning next season and who he's going to buy and who he's going to sell and and he'll be obsessed with it. That's his job from half past eight tomorrow night, I think. So uh, we'll see the big man comes up with. And there's, 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 there's so many potential answers to that question. You know, you have to get, I mean, we've got a big, big squad. All these loan players are going to come back. Uh, we'll have to deal with speculation and players maybe want to move. Players themselves, if, 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 if players want to move on, as Ange says himself, He'll move on, you know. Mm. The same way if Ange wants to move on, he'll he'll move on. So, yeah, I mean, there's a big squad to try and deal with, and then we all need to bring in a bit more because a bit more quality. Because if we want to improve in Europe, and Europe for me is always the kind of main the main place to be. And even though we be glimpses of kind of good stuff last season, it wasn't a good campaign at all in terms of points on the board. So we need to put more points on the board next season, and that means having a bit more quality in the building. So, and I've said before, all the time in the podcast, if you're a manager, your job is to replace every single player in your team with somebody better, subject to the budget requirements that you've got. So you want somebody who's better than Kyogo, whether he goes or not, you need somebody else who's better than him and better than Jota and better than Carter Rickards, whatever. So that's, that's the manager's job. It's an intense job. Ange loves doing the job. I mean, Ange, I mean, the thing of what we've got in our favour, whether it counts for nothing, there's not, is, is Ange loves the club. Mm. He loves the history. Yeah. loves the players. Loves the fans. He loves everything about it. You can't knock back your fantasy job. We can't compete with that. But he just loves it. 
and he'll be loving, you know, if he is staying, if he's not been offered that job, that half past eight to one night, he might have a couple of Fosters. After that, he's getting down to the McCarthy's out and Barca, and Barca's is out and Nayeti, oh, chase him and whatever. Then we put a bid in for you know, all these guys he's got in these kind of uh, hit lists. So that's what I'm hoping. He maybe goes back to Celtic Park tomorrow night, has a few wee Fosters, and then maybe, maybe, maybe Sunday morning, maybe we'll give him tomorrow night to enjoy himself, to get to Glasgow with his pyros to meet Lloyd. And then on Sunday morning he gets he gets down to business for, for next season. That's that's the hope I have. Jim Orr, I don't know if it's the excitement of Vegas, but uh, the positivity that's been flowing through uh, your contribution today has been, you know, something that I didn't quite expect. I'm not saying you're a negative guy, but I'm loving that. So I'm just going to be making the plans tomorrow night at, at half past eight. That is super. Old positive guy. This is the old positive guy now. That's what it is. The old positive guy. I want a prediction from you. Um before we go, gentlemen, I'm going to start with you, Lloyd. And I've heard a lot of confident predictions in the, the the comments today. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Way over 900 on the live stream today, which is just tremendous. Please give us a thumbs up if you enjoy Axel on a daily basis. Lloyd, Patrick, Jepson, give me a prediction for Hamden tomorrow. 4 0. 4 0 Celtic. A lot of people saying that in the comments section. Jim Moore? 3 0. Two in the first half, one in the second half. Okay, you know, no one generally asks me for my prediction because What's I. Your prediction, I'm Paul. Always... What's your prediction, Paul? Okay, thanks, thanks for picking up on that, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to say five nil. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to say five, five nothing Celtic. Celtic. Um, Just where you clarify um, that I was going to say who for, but good, that's good. You clarify that. Good. And I'm going to say that it's going to be an unlikely first goal scorer, so it'll be Carol right. Starfield to right. score the first right. goal. Right. Come and see us live. We're going to be on stage with Gordon Strack, and there's going to be a big announcement actually next week in relation to Axon Live. So stay tuned for that. It'll be on the socials and we'll talk about it on the Axon Bulletin. Gordon Strachan, he won three league titles in a row at Celtic. He won a double. He took us to the Champions League last 16 twice in a row. And he was doing that on a much lesser budget than Martin O'Neill. He is for me one of the most engaging, um, on point, and humorous individuals to listen to both on screen and on stage and I will be privileged to share a stage with them in Glasgow at the end of this month. Now tickets are way over 50% sold, ticket link underneath this particular video. I think all the VIPs are sold out. Come along and hear we Gordon and even ask him a question as well. Um, thanks everybody for getting involved. Our charity endeavours continue. We are going to be supporting the fight of we, Jamie Tierney. The fundraising link is underneath this video and there are loads and loads of fundraising initiatives coming up around that as well. Thanks, everybody. Whatever you're doing tomorrow, stay safe in the celebrations. Enjoy the celebrations. I'm not counting my chickens. Just enjoy them. And thank you to Lloyd, Patrick, Jepson, and Jim Moore for joining me on a Celtic state of mind. Cheers, Paul. Thanks.